Corruption thrives during times of crisis. The coronavirus pandemic is no exception. Traders have inflated prices for scarce supplies, like masks and hand sanitizers. Politicians have received kickbacks for brokering deals. Their aim? To profit from others' misfortune. Hello and welcome to our COVID-19 special. I'm Monica Jones, thanks for tuning in. Almost 5 million people have died of COVID-19 so far. Millions more have lost their health and livelihoods. And yet there are some who have no qualms about using this major crisis for personal gain. DW's Liz Shaw reports from Africa and takes a close look at who the pandemic was especially generous to. PPE kits. Overalls, like this one here. Gloves, masks, hand sanitizers, and government financial aid are some of the things that have helped us health-wise and financially throughout the coronavirus pandemic. But some people have pocketed these medical items or the relief money to make themselves rich. The pandemic has encouraged corruption and mismanagement throughout the globe. But my question today is, who's profiting from COVID-19 in Africa? Since the outbreak of COVID-19 in Nigeria and the African countries were working, we've seen that the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. The rich who have friends in uh, corridors of power, who have allies, are the ones getting contracts, you know, to uh, uh, handle logistics, distribution, and procurement. Take Kenya, for example. Back in August 2020, Kenya was rocked by an investigative report about so-called COVID millionaires. 15 business people and government officials are being investigated for allegedly misusing millions of dollars meant to buy medical supplies. In Zimbabwe, Health Minister Obadiah Moyo was fired after being involved in a corrupt multi-million dollar deal awarded to a foreign company to provide anti-COVID drugs and protective equipment. In South Africa, a report by the country's Auditor General revealed, quote, frightening findings. Among other things, some government departments bought protective gear at five times the price advised by the Treasury. In Nigeria, corrupt politicians even held back food aid aimed for those who've been hardest hit by the crisis. We saw where COVID relief materials, so rice, grain, indomie, uh, uh, were stored in the warehouse and, and the politicians were waiting for political campaign season. They, they went further to rebrand COVID-19 relief materials and put in their names and their pictures. Hamzat's campaign managed to keep track of more than $500 million in seven African countries to see what it was planned for and how it is being used. It's money from donors, grants, or from the government's budget. Still, many questions about where and how the money is being spent often go unanswered by those in charge. Private donation was made to the FCT administration under the President Mohamed Buhari's cabinet, where these resources was meant to provide palliative, provide testing kits, and also support frontline health workers. Uh, so first, we asked the minister of the FCT, there's a city centre, is he utilising this money? And he was mute about it. So till date, we've, he has not given public knowledge or expenditure of how he has utilised this money. So. Why does the pandemic open doors to corruption so wide? Economists believe one reason is a lack of checks and balances in these extraordinary times. You know, people take advantage of the fact that the pandemic is more or less like a security situation. So it is easy for a public officer to say, yeah, this is a security uh, situation. It's an emergency situation. So we need to take decisions without recourse to the law. Um, that has been the problem. Another thing that encourages mismanagement of resources is the fact that those involved often don't have to fear legal consequences. In the case of the Kenyan COVID millionaires, there's criticism that the investigations that started in August 2020 are taking way too long. Why hasn't anyone been charged in court despite this period of time? 
then you kind of then get suspicious and worry and, and start worrying that they could actually be a, a process to cover up or, you know, or, or sanitize, you know, someone or some people um, because they are connected to, you know, certain elites in this country. Of course, the temptation to turn a quick buck is high for people close to the corona money. But let's not be too negative here. The pandemic has also proven to be a huge business opportunity to some. They are turning profits in a legal way. In Africa, smart business owners have grabbed opportunities offered by the pandemic, sometimes in not so obvious branches like yoga. For example, South African yoga instructor Tidimalo Jasmine Selako decided to move her lessons online after a countrywide lockdown made classes impossible. Since then, the number of her followers has skyrocketed. These days, I find that most of the things that I do are online. Um, and I could say that it really has given me space um, to become more innovative and it's really pushed me to grow and see how I can strategically grow as a creative, as a brand, and just keep myself grounded as well. Services that had to shift online have given a boost to telecommunication companies. People are spending more data to stay in touch with friends and family and to get the latest on COVID developments. Also, when many schools and colleges closed, e-learning forced people to invest in data packages for their education. We're still in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic. Just as it is with any crisis of this scale, there are winners and losers. The question remains, how many of those winning financially in Africa are actually playing fair? And just for the record, Africa isn't alone when it comes to exploiting the coronavirus crisis for personal gain. We've had cases of nepotism and lobbying scandals here in Europe too. So what role does governance play in a pandemic? Time for one of your questions now. Over to Derek. How has the pandemic affected the vision of what it means to have proper political leadership? Could politics and science be closer partners in the future? These aren't really science questions, and trying to answer them on, on my part is going to require lots of speculation, but I think they're important questions to be asking. And so, here goes, first one first, um, a tough nut. What constitutes good political leadership in this kind of crisis? Well, that depends on who you ask, of course, but maybe we can all agree on a few fundamentals. Um, the first of which I think is clear communication, a, a real biggie. Um, trust is a very hard thing to build. And I think in countries where leaders have tried to communicate clearly what measures needed to be taken to fight the pandemic and why, people have been more likely to trust them and, and to follow the rules. Um, to build trust, those kinds of decisions have to be based on an explainable framework. So they can't just be someone's opinion, but they have to reflect the best scientific evidence that we have at a given moment. Um, now, the best evidence we have evolves, of course, as more research comes in. And new research can always overturn earlier research. That's happened lots of times as, as we've groped our way forwards into the darkness that, that is this pandemic. But Although science-based decisions won't all be perfect and, and will require updating all the time, science still provides the brightest torch that we have in that darkness. And future political leaders who understand that will, I think, be better at building trust. And that brings me to question two about whether I think the pandemic will foster closer bonds between science and politics in the future. And I think that unquestionably it will, because as a friend put it to me recently, uh, science is currently saving the world. Um, now, lots of people might say that that's 
over-dramatizing, but I happen to think that it's pretty on target. Um, without the research that led to understanding what measures work best to control the spread of COVID-19 or, or how it can best be treated, and of course, uh, the lightning fast development of vaccines against it, the virus would unquestionably be killing and, and crippling many, many more of us. And though I don't want to leave you with a downer, this pandemic is just one of the major, major challenges that we are going to face as a species in really the pretty near future. For me, science provides the best chances that we're going to have for addressing and hopefully mitigating those challenges. So I think it'll have to play a much more prominent role in politics in the future as well. And before we go, here's a look at some of the other COVID-19 stories making news around the world. People are protesting in New York against a COVID-19 vaccination requirement for staff in the city's public school system. The mandate went into force on Monday. Some demonstrators pulled down a COVID testing tent during the protest. The pandemic has cost the global airline industry nearly $200 billion, according to the International Air Transport Association. That figure is much higher than was previously forecast. IATA says carriers that rely on long-haul flights suffered more than their regional peers, which have started to recover. And that's all for this edition of COVID-19 Special. Thanks for watching.